Um, <clears throat> title of my talk is Deformations and Embeddings uh, of Compact Three-Dimensional Strictly Cedar Convex uh, CR Manifolds. Uh, and uh, I want to start off before I forget to say that this uh, talk is based on a uh, joint paper that was recently posted to RT with <coughs> Sean Curry, uh, my former postdoc in San Diego, now Kenya Track at Oklahoma State. And uh, the, uh, the paper is listed here. Um, and uh, since uh, I suspect I may have um, <coughs> A little too much material for a 40 45 minute talk. Uh, so, without further ado, I'll just uh, jump right into the details. So, we're going to be talking about embankments of strictly comics manifolds. So, let me uh, start with the prototype, namely uh, those that come from or <clears throat> those that are boundaries of strictly pseudo convex domains in complex places. So, um, let us start with a uh, bounded strictly pseudo convex domain. Uh, we're going to assume a smooth boundary. We're going to call the boundary M and uh, inherits a CR structure from the MBS complex structure uh, J. And uh, if you don't know what strictly pseudo convex means, um, you can just imagine the following picture where the domain omega is the N. Near every point, you can change the double or the coordinates so that the domain becomes linearly convex with quadratic contact. So that's what uh, strict pseudo convexity means. Hi, Peter. Uh, sorry for interrupting. Uh, there seem to be some audio problems. So would you be oh. able to maybe use the okay. microphone, switch your microphones, and use the microphones on the other device? See if that helps. Uh, I think it is off. Um, um, okay, so um, I think it's on on one of your devices, maybe, and off on the other. Maybe you could switch them. Okay, let's see what I can do about that. Well, it's actually clear now. Oh, it is. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So uh, what is a CR structure? Well, the CR structure has two pieces of data. One is a uh, co-rank one subbundle that we're going to call H of the tangent, the real tangent bundle. Uh, and on that uh, co-rank one bundle, there is a formal integral complex structure, J. And we're often going to refer to J as the CR structure. And what's uh, formal integrability here? It simply means that if you complexify H and uh, you split the complexified space into the plus I and minus I eigenspace of J, then sections of the T10, which is the plus one eigenspace, if you take the commutator of two such sections, then they remain <coughs> in T10. Uh, one thing to note here is that <clears throat> when n is one, or which is the same as saying that m is three-dimensional, which is the topic of the talk, uh, the integrability condition is actually uh, trivial because the model is one-dimensional, uh, and uh, so the integrability condition is automatic. Hey, Peter, so, um, uh, sorry, it's still causing a problem. Uh, could I just try changing the settings for you? Uh, yes. So I've sent a request to unmute your other device. If you can look at the other device and unmute it, I think it should be good. Okay, let me, I should then turn off the, uh, the speaker on my other, otherwise it's gonna cause an echo. So let me try that. Okay, okay so, now so now I think I'm speaking to my other device. Does it sound better? Yeah. Can you hear me? Okay. All right, let's, let's uh, try to continue. Um, so yes, the formal integrability condition is trivial when n is one. Uh, another thing to note, uh, well, to, to, uh, uh, to point out is that H is actually a contact distribution. 
this is not the general case for CR structures, but the fact that it's strictly pseudocom X uh, implies actually that H is contact, which as you, as you know, means if you take uh, a theta, which is a real one form annihilating H, then theta wedge D, uh, D theta to the N here uh, is uh, non-zero, it's a volume form. We can also introduce the Levy form. Uh, you don't have to think about it much if you haven't seen it before, but the strict pseudoconvexity means that this uh, Hermitian form, or it's Hermitian if you complexify it, is positive definite. Now this, uh, this data here, M with data H and J, is the prototype of a compact, strictly pseudoconvex CR manifold of dimension, real dimension two, uh, n plus one, so odd dimensional. Uh, and we're going to just talk about an abstract or compact strictly pseudoconvex CR manifolds in general will simply be a triplet like this, MHJ, where H and J are as above, satisfy those conditions. Uh, and the general basic problem that we're going to address is the embeddability in general of an abstract strictly pseudoconvex CR manifold. Okay, so um, oh, it's lagging. Uh, so what, what do we mean by embeddability then? Well, we're going to be a little more generous and not require uh, the, the strictly pseudoconvex uh, CR manifold to actually be the boundary of a domain. But we're just going to say it's embeddable if there's a CR embedding uh, phi that sends it into CN for some N could be much larger than the little n uh, that goes into the dimension of, of m. So you have a situation where m, you have the mapping phi, you send it into something compact in C capital N. It's not the boundary of a domain, but by Harvey and Lawson, there is some possibly singular complex analytic variety v such that phi of m, the image here, is the boundary of this compact space uh, v. So um, now it turns out that this, in, this problem is not so interesting if n is greater than or equal to 2, because boutet Monvel, whoops, I knew that was going to happen. Um, Okay, um, made it very big. All right. Okay. All right. That's the the risk you're running when you're touching uh, the screen like that. Um, so Buterimon Val. Uh, <clears throat> uh, prove that they're always embeddable if, uh, if the dimension of M is five or higher, in other words. Okay, and now, okay, so now the uh, technology never works the way you wish it to work. Um, See if I can get it to actually, okay, it wants to scroll. All right, well, um, sorry, you're gonna have to endure the talk this way then, unless I go like this. Okay, let's try that again. Okay. All right. So um, now for, for three dimensional CR manifolds, that is when n is equal to one, then uh, the situation is more subtle. <clears throat> and uh, here actually most are not embeddable. Uh, there are even three uh, real analytic uh, CR structures, global, that are not embeddable globally. Locally, they always are. So I should point out here, in, in the remainder of this talk, all CR manifolds will be compact and strictly pseudoconvex, even if I fail to, uh, to repeat that all the time. 
Um, and there are smooth ones that are not even locally embeddable. So this is, uh, credits here go to uh, many people, but uh, most notably perhaps Rossi, uh, Nirenberg, uh, Burns Epstein, uh, and others. Now the goal of this talk, or the goal of the paper, is to uh, get a good geometric description of the embeddable CR three manifolds. And, and there, as you will see, um, when I go, go ahead here, you will see there's others who have uh, done uh, a good job of doing this as well. And I will mention them as we go along. There are other approaches to um, understanding the embeddable CR three manifolds uh, via more functional analytic descriptions. And here there's work by, I should mention, uh, well, so it's in terms of understanding D bar B, box B, uh, the CR Panitz operator, for instance, uh, and these sort of things. And there, there's <clears throat> work here that I'm not going to mention further um, by Cohn, uh, Burns, um, uh, Case, Shanillo, Yang, uh, more recent work of Takeuchi, uh, and so forth. Um, another thing to note here, or that, that is <clears throat> particularly interesting for what we're going to do, is embeddings of uh, of uh, three-dimensional strictly pseudo-convex compact things are stable, which means that if you start with something that is already embedded in C2, that is, it comes from the boundary of some domain in C2, uh, <clears throat> then if you just look at small deformations of, of the structure there, uh, then they're going to remain embeddable in C2, provided they are embeddable at all. As I mentioned, most are not going to be embeddable, but those that are embeddable and are closed are going to be embeddable in C2. So this is a, an important result uh, proved by Lambert, Lampert, and we sometimes refer to this as Lampert stability. Okay, so uh, now we're going to talk a little bit about the space of CR structures. So this is what we want to understand, the space of CR structures on a contact three manifold. So if you remember, we really want to understand this, the, space, the, the <clears throat> space of CR structures on a three manifold. Um, but here's um, just a note here that if you, it does that again, okay. I don't know why it does that. Okay. Um, Okay, so <clears throat> I'll just say, I'll, I'll try to touch the screen as little as possible because it seems to uh, screw things up. Um, but um, <clears throat> so if you start with an M, which is sitting in C2 and look at the CR structure that it inherits, <clears throat> then you really wanna look at the space of all H tilde, J tilde that are near H J on M. Okay, so you want to deform both the contact distribution and the CR structure. But then there's a theorem by Gray that says essentially says that you can, in fact, if you it would it suffices to <clears throat> only under only very the, uh, the, the, the actual CR structure. So it suffices to consider uh, structures J on M with a, a fixed uh, contact, with <clears throat> the fixed uh, contact uh, distribution that you have. So for that reason, we're gonna actually start with a compact three manifold and, and fix an oriented contact structure already. And we're going to work with that. <clears throat> now, the space of smooth oriented uh, CR structures is a sub bundle of the bundle of endomorphisms. Uh, and one thing that uh, <clears throat> makes the study of CR structures a little bit complicated, more complicated, is the fact that you have. On the contact manifold, you have the, uh, the group of smooth orient orientation preserving contact diffeomorphisms that act <clears throat> and preserve the contact structure, and they act on the sections 
of, or on the CR structures by just pulling back, uh, pulling back the uh, CR structure J. So <clears throat> that means that when you act by C with some contact diffeomorphism psi, you get a different or potential, conceivably or apparently different CR manifold. Uh, but of course, the two CR structures, the CR manifolds are CR equivalent because psi by definition is a, is a CR diffeomorphism uh, between the two. So, um, <clears throat> the next thing to note is that the uh, space of uh, space of CR structures and the group of um, contact diffeomorphisms are both Frechet manifolds. In fact, <clears throat> as I noted here, they're so-called tame Frechet manifolds. I don't want to go into the details there, but it means Frechet manifolds with good estimates on them. So <clears throat> we have the situation is we have something like this. We have a box here that represents the CR structures. On <clears throat> uh, the CR or the contact manifold M uh, near some given uh, CR structure J. Uh, and then we have the orbits of the contact diffeomorphisms gives you an equivalent class of equivalent CR structures. So you have these families of uh, orbits. And what you would like to do would be convenient if you could find a slice, a transversal slice to all of these structures, at least near your given one. Uh, <clears throat> that gives you, then you can sort of look on the slice and get, <clears throat> and get uh, pairwise inequivalent uh, CR structures. And that's uh, essentially, you can essentially do that. And that is a, a result by Cheng and Lee from 95 uh, that we call the local slice theorem. And it says pretty much exactly that, <clears throat> except when the way it's formulated here is not exactly true because you have a little bit of a problem with, um, with the fact that you have the automorphisms of the CR structure. Um, that actually, of course, is sitting inside the group of uh, contact diffeomorphisms, uh, but they don't change the, uh, <clears throat> the CR structure at all by definition. So somehow you have to get rid of that if you want, uh, if you want everything in the slice to be pairwise and equivalent. Um, and the way to do that is you can either do it, it depends on whether or not the structure is spherical or non-spherical. You do it in two different ways, because in the non-spherical case, <coughs> excuse me, the automorphism group is compact and you can quotient out by it. <coughs> in the spherical case, uh, you have to do something different, and we're going to come back to that a little bit later. Okay, so <coughs> from now on, for simplicity, <coughs> we're going to consider only uh, CR structures on S3, the standard three sphere, near the standard three sphere structure that it gets as being the, <coughs> the boundary of the unit ball in C2. Let's start with an example, the so-called Rossi spheres <coughs> that gives, well, one of the first families of non-embeddable uh, structures. And they're sort of the, the simplest deformations you can think of. So again, we start with the, the, the standard sphere. <clears throat> the standard CR structure uh, can be defined by the, <coughs> by the global one zero vector field that we call here Z1. Um, and we can deform the CR structure, um, keeping again, fixing the contact structure on S3 by the following formula. For t greater than zero, we define a new one zero vector field Z1t by the following formula. Just add a constant t time, uh, times the bar of Z1 to it, and you get a different CR structure. Um, <clears throat> and Rossi realized that this CR structure, somehow the simplest deformation you can think of, <clears throat> is never embeddable for any t greater than zero. Of course, for t equals zero, it's the standard structure. Um, to sort of uh, just to illustrate that the the matter is somewhat complicated, <clears throat> if you take the Rossi sphere 
and you take a quotient, a z by 2z quotient of that structure, then it actually happens to be embeddable in C3, but not in C2. If you take another z by 2z uh, quotient, then it's embeddable in P2, but not in C2. And as I mentioned, we're going to be concerned with CR structures near the standard sphere. And by uh, Lampert stability, that means that the embeddability we have to consider is only embeddability in C2. OK, so <clears throat> now we're going to look at deformations of the unit sphere. Again, this is we start with the standard structure. <clears throat> and now, any CR structure with, uh, on, the, con on the, the standard contact sphere <clears throat> which is sufficiently close to J0, in fact, essentially all CR structures can be realized in this way, you can encode the CR structures by a so-called deformation tensor, which is simply, uh, it's simply a function. Once you've chosen a global uh, one zero vector field, and we have at this point, so we call it Z1, uh, you can realize any, uh, <clears throat> any, uh, see our structure by, by just a, a function that we call phi. It's really a tensor, but we're often going to call it phi. By this formula, <clears throat> uh, the factor in front is just to, um, to, to normalize. Well, you'll, you'll see later where it comes in. It doesn't have to be there. But for uh, computational reasons, it's convenient to have it there. Now, if you would like to interpret instead, uh, we talked about the CR structures J. So if you want to go between the deformation tensor and the CR structure, uh, here's the formula for doing that. <coughs> now, <clears throat> going forward for, for computational reasons, uh, it's, it's uh, convenient to fix a contact form. Uh, and we take this sort of, we're gonna fix the standard contact form. Um, we're gonna call it theta. And uh, now the, the um, factor in front of Z1 phi is chosen so that the Levy form is constant equal to one. That's the reason. Uh, <clears throat> now, once we fix a contact form, we've in fact fixed a so-called uh, pseudo-Hermitian structure uh, on, <clears throat> on the uh, CR manifold. And once you fix a pseudo-Hermitian structure, there is a so-called uh, you get a, a Tanaka-Webster connection, theta, that you can work with. And now you can sort of work with the tools of geometric analysis. <coughs> um, OK, so now <clears throat> the first thing we're going to do is we're going to reformulate the embeddability problem uh, as a problem of solving a particular um, differential equation, a PDE on the manifold, in this case, S3. So uh, we're going to go backwards. We're going to see, we're going to start with an actual deformation M sub T inside C2. So we start, we take a deformation, smooth, one parameter family of compact, strictly superconvex hypersurfaces, where M0 is S3. <coughs> and we're going to be parametrizing it, the family by uh, uh, phi sub T, which are just the family of contact parameterizations of each of the mt and phi zero. Phi zero is just the identity. <clears throat> and then it turns out, and of course this is non-trivial, uh, but it's fairly well known, um, <clears throat> that if you now <clears throat> pull back, so you have this m sub t, and you have the contact parameterization, so you can pull everything back, and you get uh, a family of CR structures on the contact sphere. Uh, we're going to call the, uh, the structure J sub T. <clears throat> and corresponding to J sub T, we have the deformation function that we're going to call phi of T, phi 1, 1 of T. And it turns out that then uh, you get the following di uh, partial differential equation to hold, which is 4 here. Um, so phi 1, 1 of T is the deformation tensor corresponding to the CR structure JT. Uh, the, nabla sub, the nabla upper T here is simply the Tanaka-Webster curvature for the structure J sub T with the contact form fixed that we chose on the previous slide. And A here is simply the, the torsion. This is the torsion. And this is the connection. 
<clears throat> and the function f sub t that solves this differential equation <clears throat> is, is simply a component of the corresponding variational vector field uh, that corresponds to the uh, contact parameterization phi sub t. In fact, geometrically, it turns out that the real part of <clears throat> f of t corresponds to, in some sense, the normal velocity of the deformation at time t, whereas the imaginary part f of t, so f of t clearly is a complex, um, complex valued function, and the imaginary part corresponds to an infinitesimal Hamiltonian potential. So it generates uh, a contact diffeomorphism or family of contact diffeomorphisms. Um, <clears throat> so in some sense, we have the following. Starting start with a sphere. And then you deform it, and then you have the normal velocity, and you have a contact potential, and then you have to translate it back. So f of t is a function on, on S3, so you actually have to pull it back also, which <clears throat> uh, poses a little bit of a problem. Uh, and f sub t, we, we're going to refer to it as potentials for the deformations. <clears throat> we point out here that the differential operator here actually happens to be um, well, it's not a random differential operator. It is a, a CR invariant operator, um, the second order CR invariant operator. Um, <clears throat> and you have to interpret that uh, suitably uh, uh, in terms of densities, but I don't want to go into that. <clears throat> now, now we're gonna go backwards. So we, here on the previous slide, we started with a family of deformations inside T C2, and we said we get a family of potentials. Now, suppose we have a family of solutions to the differential equation on the previous slide with a given phi 1, 1 of t. So you have a given uh, one parameter family of CR uh, structures or equivalently of, of deformations phi, phi of t. And you suppose you have a family of potentials for those. Can you then, does that mean that you're embeddable? And the answer is yes, turns out to be the case, <clears throat> uh, well, so that's theorem one here. That's precisely the case. Uh, and then there's a <clears throat> star, an asterisk here, and that means that it's not completely true what I say. I sometimes <clears throat> lie a little bit, but I, I try at least to be honest uh, when I talk about it. So the star here means, actually, you have to have the condition that the real part F sub t is a strict sign. It doesn't change sign on S3, which essentially means <clears throat> that the corresponding uh, uh, family of embeddings uh, turns out to be a foliation. Now, the strategy of the proof is sort of clear. Uh, if you look at the previous slide, you sort of try to construct a variational vector field from the solution F, and you integrate it to get the phi sub t. There's uh, a lot of uh, difficulties, however, in actually verifying that the in intuitive thing that you want to construct actually does what it is you're trying to do. And <clears throat> it turns out that in order to prove that, <clears throat> uh, we use uh, pretty, uh, we, we use a construction uh, that's due to uh, Hirachi, Maragami, and Matsumoto in a paper from 2017. Okay, so just to summarize, <clears throat> to check if you have a family phi of t and you wanna check if that family of deformations is embeddable, it's necessary and sufficient to, to solve this CR invariant equation. That's displayed here. Okay, so now <clears throat> let's, uh, we're gonna analyze this problem. That is the problem now is to solve the, uh, the equation on the previous slide. Uh, and we're gonna look at the linearized problem first. So, um, so we're gonna continue, we're still on, the, on S3. <clears throat> we're gonna uh, have a fixed uh, contact form theta as before and Z1 as before. And now we're gonna, the space of deformations, <clears throat> as I said now, is just a space of functions, smooth functions, C infinity S3, we're just gonna call it D. <clears throat> and we're going to, the subspace or the subset of embeddable ones, we're going to call D sub M. 
<clears throat> now, if you just look at equation four at t equals zero, um, then uh, you're just getting, well, you're just getting uh, the Tanaka-Webster Tanaka curvature for the standard sphere. And, and there, the, uh, for that, the torsion is zero. Um, the nabla one is just the vector z1, acts as the vector z1 on, on tensors as well. Um, so that means that uh, being, well, at t equals zero, the, at the linearized level, being an embeddable deformation at the linearized level is just being in the image of z1 squared. Um, okay, so now we're going to try to understand this in terms of spherical harmonics. So we're going to decompose uh, <clears throat> um, frac d into spherical harmonics. So these are the uh, spherical harmonics of degree PQ. And we're going to, uh, of course, uh, <clears throat> decompose, well, we're going to decompose the deformation tensor uh, into its spherical harmonic terms. Uh, and again, okay. So um, the thing to note here is that Z1 and Z1 bar plays very well with the spherical harmonics. So if you draw a picture here of the spherical harmonics with PQ along the axes, then if you look at the spherical harmonics at, uh, at the point P comma Q, it turns out that Z1 maps it isomorphically to the uh, spherical harmonics with the following coordinates and its adjoint which maps the opposite way is just minus z1 the conjugate so this is uh, useful and in particular then we see that d0 which we call the space of embeddable linearized deformations actually is just this space here <clears throat> where uh, yeah, so it doesn't have any components when Q is zero and one. Okay, so uh, <clears throat> an important space here when you want to look at the embeddable ones is the so-called Burns-Epstein space, what we call the Burns-Epstein space. And it's given by this uh, uh, set here. So it's probably better just to draw a picture. So here's P, here's Q. Here's two, so D zero is just everything that's above here. Now, if you take four here and then you take the diagonal here, this is the Burns-Epstein space. Okay, so it's, a, it's sitting inside D zero. Now, Burns and Epstein <clears throat> in 1990, they showed that this is a good space when it comes to um, embeddings. They showed that every sufficiently small deformation in the Burns-Epstein space is embeddable. <clears throat> in our paper, we prove <clears throat> a slightly more, uh, slightly more precise version, well, uh, a theorem that, that implies this. <clears throat> I formulated here in terms of uh, solutions to the, uh, the equation that we're looking at. And we're formulating it in terms of a one parameter family because we want to, that's the way we want to think about it. <clears throat> so we take a, a family phi 1 1 of t, that's just, you take something phi 1 1 dot, which is a linearized embeddable, well, which is, which is an element in the uh, Burns-Epstein space. Oh, yeah, so you can see that on top here. <clears throat> and then you just look at the the, the linear deformation of that, v11 dot t, uh, then you find there's a fam one, one parameter family of smooth solutions, which means that they are all embeddable. And moreover, the family f sub t is analytic in t. So you get some extra regularity in the t here. And <clears throat> in fact, the, the, the analyticity in t translates into analyticity in the contact parametrizations phi sub t from uh, here. Okay, so uh, I am rapidly approaching the uh, <clears throat> end of my talk here. So uh, let's see. Okay, so now <clears throat> if you want to, um, 
understand this um, better, so we're going to go back to um, to the, uh, the the slice theorem, and we're going to the aim. I think the aim right now is just to state the uh, slice theorem for embeddable slices or for embeddable deformations. So um, <clears throat> I'm going to go a little bit quick here. So we note that the uh, deformation space D can be split into uh, three components. One is a Burns Epstein space with a prime on it, where if you look at the definition, we've imposed something on the critical diagonal. So the diagonal starting at uh, PQ equals uh, zero four. The little h here uh, you see uh, right there, I'll explain where that comes from. And then D0 perp is just the orthogonal complement of D0, the one we uh, split, <coughs> talked about before. Now, what does the h mean? Well, the h actually corresponds to the linearized action of the uh, contact diffeomorphisms. Um, and uh, it's explained here in the, uh, in the bullet point. So it actually, can be identified with the tangent space at the identity of the contact diffeomorphisms. Now, you have to be uh, careful here. Um, you can't <coughs> parametrize C, the contact, the smooth contact diffeomorphisms, by the exponential map. So I wrote the exponential map here, but I put a star on it, which means I'm lying. <coughs> so in fact, you have to do something very non-trivial, which is done in the paper of Chang and Lee, you get some uh, alternative parametrization, but it's still a parametrization. You can view it as a parametrization from the tangent space. So I'm, I'm skipping the details there. Um, okay, so uh, that, well, so that suggests, <clears throat> if you think about it, that suggests that a slice This is a reasonable thing as a slice for all the CR deformations. Uh, and this would be a candidate for a slice for embeddable ones. Um, <clears throat> okay, so now I was hoping to talk a little bit about the Mark deformations, but since I'm running behind here, I'll, I'll just skip it, uh, well, skim over it very quickly. We're going to look at the space of marked deformations, which means for each deformation, we're also going to make a choice of, the, uh, of a point in the CR Carton bundle, which is isomorphic to the eight-dimensional group SU to one modulo its finite center. Um, okay, so... <clears throat> Uh, here's a theorem, and the first part of the theorem really, well, is simply the Cheng Li slice theorem. It actually says that um, you get a slice for all the CR diffeomorphisms by taking what I proposed on the previous slide, the prime Burns Epstein plus the perp of D0, and you act on it by C, that gives you exactly all the marked embeddable deformations. In the paper by Cheng and Li, they have a different slice that's more convenient for them. This is a different slice, but it's more um, geared towards the embeddable uh, deformations. Um, the the Cheng Li proof could be carried over to prove this. We give in our paper a, a, a slightly a simplified uh, proof of this particular result. And the follow-up here is that if you further restrict this, as I, as I said on the previous slide, just D prime uh, Burns Epstein, then you actually parametrize all the, uh, the marked embeddable deformations. So just to repeat here, part one is just the Cheng Li slice theorem, modified version of it. Uh, and I should say that Bland proved something in finite smoothness. He didn't look at C infinity, but he looked at uh, finite smoothness uh, in fallen Stein spaces. And he proved the normal forms theorem, which um, can be used to uh, get essentially two, uh, part two of this theorem um, in, the, in, the, uh, in the finite smoothness case. 
Okay, so uh, I'm not going to get to the end, but hopefully I can take one minute and just go through this slide. <clears throat> Is that okay? Uh, that's okay. You have three minutes left. Oh, now I can't hear anything. Um, okay. Yeah, you have th three minutes. Okay. Yeah. All right. So, um, yeah. So now I just want to give sort of a, uh, a characterization of the embeddable deformations inside the slide. <clears throat> so as we said, <clears throat> the modified Cheng Li slice uh, is <clears throat> the, uh, the, the, the direct sum of D prime Burns Epstein and the uh, perp of D zero. Now the, the Cheng Li map uh, is a map that acts on mark deformations. So that means that <clears throat> it's a tame diffeomorphism, this map. So what that means is that, uh, <clears throat> in fact, for every uh, phi zero is actually in the slice is represented by an SU21, an eight dimensional orbit of CR equivalent representatives in the slice. <clears throat> so these, so you still have some, some action of these slices <clears throat> and the, uh, the part two of the theorem really is, is, is equivalent to proving the following statement, namely that <clears throat> if you, the embeddable deformations inside the slice are precisely uh, the ones that lie in the D prime Burns Epstein. And anything that's not in D prime per, Burns Epstein, but in the slice is not all non-embeddable. So that's, uh, that's a pretty uh, clear description of this. And I should point out, this was, the question was raised by Burns and Epstein who proved one of the main things that they proved in, in their, uh, their paper was that the non-embeddable fees inside uh, this space D prime CL uh, take away D prime Burns Epstein is a G delta set. So they proved it's a dense set. Uh, and then Epstein proved later, uh, well, he proved closeness of the uh, embeddable deformation. So that means that the G delta set is open. Um, but this uh, theorem sort of uh, answers the question finally, it says that it's exactly the embeddable ones are exactly the Burns Epstein prime slice. Okay, uh, so I am going to uh, stop here.